Blog Talk Radio. The motherfucking saga continues. Continue. Yo, yo, what's up, what's up, world? It's badass, sucking like I usually do. And you better turn it up, bust some speakers out, because we off the motherfucking cup. You dig how we do it? Dog Pound Gangsta 2000 and beyond. What's up with it, John? Man, don't change that down. This should play a part of the legendary cocaine. And you tuned in live to Off the Cuff Radio. Better not touch that down. Way, way. Yeah, yeah, this is Cassidy, the hustler. And right now, you listening to the guillotine. Show them the respect they deserve, man. Off the cut radio, man. Y'all already know how they doing it, man. I need y'all to stay tuned. They've been doing it for years. So show them the respect they deserve. And you heard it out of bars, mo. Easy. Keep it moving like this. Yo, this your boy Rampage. You're now rocking with the best. With Off the Cut Radio. Classic. History. Fix your face to all you haters. We off the cup, baby. What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Bonnie Dollars, the queen of trap, representing Crenshaw. And you are now tuned in with Off the Cuff Radio. What's up? What's up, y'all? This is Miss Irresistible, giving a shout-out to the live show on Friday nights, Off the Cuff Radio. And I'm live from the 704. Make sure y'all tune in for the blazing hot music. Thursday Night Thunder, OTCF in the building. Shout out to the pilot in charge, King Eric. And, of course, I'm your co-pilot, T-Max with the facts. We're on a fly, fantastic journey. Shout out to our co-hosts in the spirit of a lot of Sam and Lady Chinchilla. And tonight, y'all, once again, in our illustrious and distinguished history of Off the Cuff Radio, we are adding on another first. We've had jewelers. We've had wrestlers. We had chefs. We've had artists. And this show is so special tonight because this is our first sneaker show. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're going to do a show that is about but not limited to sneaker culture. And the gentleman that we have on the line tonight is one of the most esteemed, one of the most influential, you know, this man right here is a walking encyclopedia of everything that has to do with shoes and if you know style sneakers are just a part as much of hip-hop fashion and fashion as much as anything um he also has his own podcast as well from the seat up and he's in he's involved in so many other excellent and engaging endeavors that we cannot wait to get into um he's amazing in all methods of everything in his madness Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the legendary obsessive sneaker <laughs> disorder paper chaser himself, Sean O. Williams. What's going on, man? What's going on, y'all? How's everybody doing tonight, man? We're good, man. We're good. We are good. A long time coming, but we finally made it happen, man. Yeah, 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 man. Thanks for the patience on that, man. You know, there's a lot going on with us, um... You know, <clears throat> launching, you know, opening our doors, I should say, for um, Hensel Lewis College of Business and Design in Detroit, Michigan, which, you know, my partner D. Wells and I, we are obsessed with sneaker disorder slash social studies, sneaker industry education program, but we are part of the Hensel Lewis College of Business and Design um, staff. We are, we are part of that movement. We have always been since before it was 
reestablished as an HBCU. So it's an exciting mm. time for us with um, us being able to sort of unofficially give sneaker culture its own HBCU. So um, it's been good. It's been a lot of um, coordinating that effort, a lot of big things that are in the works that we'll be able to share coming up soon. But, you know, for what's already out in public knowledge now, we're out based in Detroit, Michigan. Um, All of our programs are free, free tuition and free housing. You just got to come to Detroit. We are, you know, officially making the claim that You know, if you want to make it in the footwear and apparel industry from now on and you interested in taking the type of tutelage and guidance that affords you through free education and free housing, then get your ticket to Pensol Lewis College of Business and Design. But, um, you know, outside of that, you know, as you guys have stated, you know, my journey goes back 37 years now with sneakers. You know, since 13 years old and I'm 50 now. So, you know, I've owned thousands of pairs in this lifetime. And Mm. um, years have passed where in 2007, my my partner D. Wells and I started the first sneaker podcast in the industry called Obsessive Sneaker Disorder, which, you know, became a launch pad for, you know, a, a, a business in consulting and then ultimately our sneaker industry education training. So... A podcast was the birth of all of that. Man. That's dope. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was texting King earlier, Sean, because this is something with off the cuff. Uh, shout out to my brother, man, because there have been a lot of ideas, you know, that I came to him about. And he was always, you know, we've always been trying to expand the brand. And um, this was something I told him, this would be a really dope build to talk to somebody who is so intimately knowledgeable and a savant on everything that is sneaker culture. You know, um, I mean, you're the guy. <laughs> I, mean, that, and, um, I mean, of course, shout to you, Sean, you know, from a couple months back when uh, you, you uh, were so gracious to let me in on your live, you know what I'm saying? And we were shopping it up for a little bit, man, you know, so... Um, I guess this is where we get to the Genesis, like Nas on the Elmatic, taking it back to the classic. How did this all start for you? 13 years old, man, growing up in New York City, Brooklyn, New York. I'm a child of hip-hop, so I was here for the birth of the culture, hip-hop culture, not sneaker culture, the birth of hip-hop culture, and growing up in, you know, watching the quiet transition of taking place in different segments of New York, you know, separately to what was beginning to happen in the, in the early 80s with, you know, the collective unity and then the word being spread, you know, all over about hip hop culture and what's happening in New York. So, you know, growing up in that existence, a fresh pair of sneakers was a part of your hip hop uniform. It wasn't, oh, we're playing the sneaker game. You couldn't have a fresh outfit and dirty ass sneakers. So sneakers being chosen to be the official footwear for hip hop because of them representing anti establishment from the fashion sense, you can't show up with a totally fresh outfit on head to ankle and then you got some dirty ass shoes on. That just wasn't the way it goes. Everything had to be fresh. So you know, for me, I was able to get any sneakers I wanted from an early age as long as I kept my grades up. My mom bought me any sneaker I ever asked for. So I just had to do my job. So academically, the incentive was there to keep doing that and keep getting fresh shit. And then, you know, by 15, I was already working, you know, the type of jobs where I was making enough money to start buying my own shoes. And my level of income between 15 and 20 working different jobs and excelling academically I was making more money than the average person my age should be making so I was able to afford a lot of shit you know I've had over 4,000 pairs of sneakers in this lifetime and most of that is from my (laughs) earlier years and that includes the Um, collector items too right well that includes everything over time like 
this is a cumulative number, not a what I have now number because right back then right, we right. wore shit, beat it up, and got rid of it. There was no sneaker game per se that required you to keep everything. It was all about wearing it and getting more. Wear it, get more. Wear it, get more, and then passing it along to your family, donating, beating it up, playing ball, playing whatever. Like, we wore our shoes, you know? There was literally no excuse to stockpile a pair of shoes just to look at it. Back then, that would you'd be considered an idiot to do that. You know, people would do that now and buy a shoe and look at it. Fucking jerk off to it. Do all kind of dumb shit. We <laughs> did not grow up in that. Okay. You know, they're doing, uh, you know, doing silly stuff like lick the bottom of the yeah. shoes. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's just a gesture. I don't even count that as anything really far-fetched. But, you know, for people who are just buying shoes and they just, because it's on their list of grails to collect, like, I don't get that, you know? I don't get that from the consumer side where if I spent my money, why the fuck shouldn't I wear it? And I don't even get that from the creator side that I'm heavily immersed in because I know how much it involves to make a shoe. So for on the business side, for people to go through so much to have a shoe made and then put on the market for somebody to just buy it to look at it, it seems even dumber on that side than on the consumer side to me. So... I've just never been about that. A lot of people in my circle have never been about that. You know, they're, they're, they're made to be worn. And if at some point you're not going to wear them, give them away. Use them as a way to get somebody else into them or a way to help people who are in need. Like, there's a purpose for somebody else. So I don't get that piece. I've never been a co-signer of that. So many other ways you can touch people's lives through sneakers, a lot of which I personally do. So holding on to a shoe just to look at is some really dumb, sucky shit to me. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing about it too, Sean, because uh, you spoke on that and I was laughing because I was, I should have put a disclaimer at the beginning of the show, like, okay, not only does this man know shoes, but he's also going to rip James y'all a couch on some of this shit he's saying too, because we know how passionate you are about it. In terms of grinding the feet, you know, grinding the feet in somebody about it. Um, When we think about sneaker culture, Sean, um, we we look at it as something that really, like you said, from from its nascent phases. I mean, when we think about Rudolph and Ari Dostler, the founders of Adidas, when we think about Bill Bowerman and Phil Knight, who would form Nike, you know, all of these brands from the past to now a Kanye with the Yeezys, you know, Master P when he had his sneaker line back in the day. Of course, you know, I mean, dude, we, we got so much to talk about in this time. We have about talking about, you know, from the process, marketing, uh, quality, uh, in terms of how, you know, how popular brands like Jordans, which I have so many of, you know, shameless plugs, mm-hmm. how Jordans were kind of low for a minute in terms of they were always fashionable, but even then they were, for a time, not really in demand. And then 2011, a lot of people say that's when Jordans blew up again, when the when the third retro, or well, the second retro, but, you know, third release of the Concords came in 2011, and shit just got way back up again. You know, we have a, I mean, there's a lot to get into, man. I mean, um, so I guess we, I guess we're where we can start uh, is when you look at hip hop fashion um, from it, of course, it's always been part of it. Adidas with the track suits, of course, Run DMC, you know, with my Adidas. You know, of course, you had the Bally's, you know. Uh, I mean, man, I mean, it's always, like you said, been a part of the, the uniform. You know, it's like having yep. a dope-ass car, you know, but you got regular rims on it, or you got a busted-ass car with fly rims on it. The shit don't, it, it doesn't <laughs> correlate. Everything has to match. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, it all has yep. to come together because it, it the, the aesthetics, of it, if you understand it, what it's supposed to mean when you rock it, it's supposed to symbolize style. Um, yep. You know, well, 
ostentatiousness is something that can be kind of over the top with it because it's really about making yourself look fresh. It's uh, and sometimes yep. some people go too far trying to show off because it's like anything. If you've got a dope outfit, whether it's a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars combined, the shit is going to be flat regardless. Um, tell us about your journey in terms of where you really started with the podcast and how you would end up interacting with some of these uh, the sneaker industry in terms of talking to some of the people really um, in ingrained in great ingrained in it, and then the people, the designers, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the uh, the taste makers, the ad execs. Everything, because we got to go into everything from authority bias in terms of what influences people to, you know, branding, everything. Sean, the floor is yours. Run with it, dog. And we just going to catch those alley you keep throwing. Run the point. <laughs> well, the show started in 2007, the 25th anniversary of Air Force Ones. Um, mm-hmm. Our original logo was the bottom of Air Force Ones with, like, OSD etched in as part of the tread pattern for our original logo um, mm-hmm. that we ended up changing at some point now that people know us for. Um, mm-hmm. And it was started because of how mad we were with how the fifth anniversary of Air Force Ones with putting out too many shoes and, you know, really just flooding the market with air forces of all kind of dumb colors and themes and everything. And, you know, it just really was over the top ridiculous and not smart um, branding for us, to our, in our opinion. So, you know, the first the first podcast was D by itself for 15 minutes on August 27, mm-hmm. 2007. And then after the feedback from that, we fleshed out a more... Um, elaborate show that we ran with a couple of weeks later. Um, mm-hmm. And we were the only ones not talking Nike and Jordan after that. You know, because you can go on, if you look into any website that's still around now and see what their content looked like back in 2007, it was all Nike, all Jordan. Adidas wasn't getting right. no love. Nobody was getting love. It was all Nike, all Jordan, all the time. And we just right. wanted to be different. So we started talking about industry news, endorsements, lawsuits, tech. We had connections to the designers at Nike already, so they were able to give us stories that nobody had ever heard before. Um, mm. You know, access to people like Tinker, um, Jason Maiden, yeah. Wayne, yeah. you know, Wilson Smiths. You know, we so many people we have access to and had access to and you know, are still friends and people we communicate with to this day, E. Scott Morris, and, you know, we true heavyweights, black people, heavyweights of design that nobody knew. And we started really getting inside track on what was really behind the creative process and some of the things that these designers were dealing with just to get things out to the market. And not only was it providing a new perspective for us, but it was providing a new perspective for the listeners who were downloading our show to the tune of about 10,000 a week. Oh, wow. So, you know, we, we have overall, before we stopped doing the show from 2007 to, to 2014, we had close to 12 million audio downloads. Dude, how does it feel to know that y'all are picking up like that? I mean, um, I, I mean, you know, we, King and myself, you know, the team, we look at what we did with the show, what we're doing and how we've been moving. You know, and we're still going, you know, in terms of still 12 million down dog. I mean, what was it like to know that you had that type of, uh, that you would hit that sweet spot with a market that, you know, you all figured it out before anybody else did about how to really, really, really um, create a real substantial conversation about it? What was that like? Well, we were the blueprint for everybody. It took it took mm-hmm. a lot of these websites that you see doing news stories and tech and all of that now. It took all of them like about nice seven to eight them? years to catch up with what we were doing. Like nice we were doing this them, every uh, week. Right, right. Seven years. We were doing this every week, talking about all of those topics and then having heavyweight guests on, you know, from all over. You know, actors like Sean McBride, who was a friend of Michael Jordan, big sneakerhead. 
you know, um, mm-hmm. folks, you know, we mentioned Tinker already. Tinker Hatfield, we had 800,000 audio downloads of Tinker's episode alone. Um, um, you know, we had... Yeah, yeah. So um, I did, yeah, I was just from different yeah, areas. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Mhm, mhm. Um, for those that know Tinker Hatfield, if you really know your shoe history, and if you claim to be a sneakerhead, Tinker Hatfield should be one of the names that you just know off rip uh, for our audience. Uh, the man who was behind so many of, you know, the iconic, you know, Air Jordan designs, you know. Uh, wasn't the first to create it, but he once Tinker got in that creative door with them, you know, he was he, he was he was an integral part and it still is. Of course, you know, um we got a shout out, rest in peace to Peter Moore, the man who created, you know, the air technology for Nike. Of course, Mary and Frank. No, 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 no. You know. Peter Moore Peter Moore designed the Air Jordan one. Okay, Peter Moore, the Air Jordan One. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, he did the Air also. Jordan thank One. Um, mm-hmm. Frank Rudy, who's an aerospace engineer, created Air that Nike. Okay, I got him crossed up. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the Air Tailwind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you Frank Sean. Frank Rudy died up. a few years ago. Yes, yes, and he's another one that he should know in terms of the sneaker game, in terms of his contributions. Um. When you look at it from the marketing perspective, because there's just so many different areas we got to get into. It's kind of hard to narrow in, so I guess we're just going to wing it in terms of certain areas. When you look at the marketing of it, um, when you see Nike pretty much had already been around, you know, since the 70s, but it took them a while to hit it until, you know, of course, 84 when they signed Michael, which Adidas had a chance to, and they chose not to. And years later, they said because he was too short, because they were still stuck in that way of the stereotypical tall basketball player, which was like guys like, like Kareem and all of them. Yeah, Magic, you know, with Converse, and Michael wanted to sign with Adidas, you know, and that didn't happen. You know, he wanted to go with Converse. They didn't offer him anything, and Nike was the one. Of course, for those who saw the last dance documentary on ESPN, excellent for those have seen it, you know, King and myself watched it. Um, they talked about that, you know, and Michael, you know, was reluctant, but his mama said, look, they're going to offer you a deal. Go at least to Oregon and listen to them, and the rest is history. Uh, when you look at endorsements, Sean, in terms of athletes today, um, I read an article last year where they were talking about how for a lot of all, um, the NBA players uh, we'll get in the NFL for a little bit, too, because we've had a couple in there that were really huge as well. But when they were talking about a lot of NBA players, they said the paradigm has changed now because there are not as many of those big contracts getting out there like there used to be. Um, you're, you're a professional of this. Please uh, tell us from your observations how the culture changed in terms of uh, – you know, pitchmen, marketing signature brands, this, that, and the other. What'd you say? Uh, I didn't hear you. Yeah, he's here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying in terms of, um, um, I'm just going to run it back because I don't know how much you had gotten, uh, what you heard I said. Um, from what, uh, in terms of how I read, it, I said I read a couple of years ago about how the sneaker paradigm in terms of the NBA, uh, and we're going to mention football too, because there was a lot of guys that uh, in football there was a lot of low key fire in the game in terms of a lot of pitchmen, but in terms of the NBA, because you could see the athletes, you could see their exploits on the court. Back in the day, you know there was a lot of guys getting money thrown at them in terms of being pitchmen, but now it's not as much in terms of the numbers, in terms of investing in players, having a signature brand, marketing, everything else. Uh, from your observation, Sean, how has that market changed and what is contingent on knowing a player who is going to be the next big thing for a company to get behind? Entertainment. Well, athletes do not. So, mm-hmm. 
a, a, a basketball athlete needs to be really, really extraordinary these days um, in order to really convince people to buy their shoes. And there really aren't a lot of NBA athletes doing that. Point blank. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, LeBron's line is 19 years and going now. Katie's line is 14 years plus. Giannis is on, like, his fourth or fifth shoe. Kyrie's on, like, his, what, seventh or eighth going on. Like, nobody cares at this point anymore about players who aren't doing anything memorable enough to make them want their shoes. And the only people who are really having that instant influence that make people excited are entertainers and and musicians, namely Kanye Mm -hmm. West, namely Travis Scott. You know, namely for Adidas, folks like Bad Bunny. Um, these yeah, athletic the moments up. that had us all yeah. emotionally tied to these shoes and the marketing, those moments don't right. exist anymore. Nobody's doing anything special. Nobody's and going out after really, seeing... What's that? Yeah, I think it's because the NBA is struggling to find a guy that can be the face of that brand. You know that they, they can market to the other. Like Jordan was a phase, uh, LeBron was a phase, Kobe was a phase. Kobe, yeah. And today it's like after the, after that class is gone. I mean, you got Steph out there, but Steph isn't really a you know he's he's a cold player. But in terms of marketing and charisma, he's not really that guy, so to speak. And they had on Zion. <clears throat> Zion Williams, but you know he ate a lot of that crab fish, so he gained about three hundred some pounds over the summer. So, well, well, I disagree that Steph isn't the guy. There are a lot of kids um, out here who want to be Steph Curry. He's the only player right. that I see out here that a lot of kids want to be like, as far as a basketball right. player. It's just that he's on a shitty ass brand. Right. Once again, Rick James in the couch, but it's real talk because with Under Armour, Sean, and you know this as well, they had like a bad quarter like four or five years ago when they lost $400 million. And, you know, Under Armour, they – it's funny, um, and this is a beautiful thing about the show because we can just talk about anything at length with no, with no script and we just go with the flow and we're going with it on this. Um, Pitchman is always a funny thing. And with Steph, of course, everybody knows he start off with Nike – was having some ankle issues with some of the shoes. Uh, now, Sean, you can give uh, – you can, you, you're can. you in this, so you know how true this was if it really did happen because they said supposedly uh, the situation why Steph left Nike was when he came to the branding when they were basically about trying to give him a pitch and there was something in, in, in terms of wrong with the presentation where his name was misspelled or they had the wrong name. In terms of the presentation, and that's when Steph went to uh, Under Armour. Uh, could you give us some more details on that story? I wasn't in the room for that, so I can't really speak on it. I've heard the same thing you guys have heard, but um, okay, yeah, we just want to know. Yeah, yeah. You look, you look at the track record of his injuries with Nike, and now right. he's with Under Armour, right. and those injuries disappeared. I think, you know, you can put two and two together on the satisfaction with what he was he was working with and Understood. how he's been relatively injury-free for the most part ever since. Right, right. But like and you said, in terms he, of... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Please, since, he, please. since he left Nike, he's won three championships. Mm-hmm. He ain't getting the fourth but, one because he ain't beating my Celtics this year, but that's another topic of discussion. <laughs> A New Yorker being a Boston fan. How ironic. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah, man. Um, but as we keep going, diving into this, but you figure with Under Armour, uh, Sean, um, Under Armour definitely found its sweet spot in terms of the athletic, in terms of the workout. You know, Kevin Plank, former University of Maryland football player, started it in 1993, I believe. Uh, took a few years for it to really get going on a – big, big level where he was having those national advertisements and everything. Of course, everybody remembers 2002 when they really broke through with the We Must Protect This House. Um, But like you said, they have not quite crossed over into that level of Puma, Nike, 
you know, Adidas where it is what they call the athlete leisure, you know, the, the lifestyle brand, you know, where that's just casual every day. And, um, you know, then, of course, the issues that happened with UCLA a couple of years ago when the pandemic hit, they tried to have that force majeure when they gave UCLA that $270 million and essentially tried to get it back because of the force majeure and act of God, and they were trying to say because UCLA did not honor their, you know, their obligation playing sports, which is like how when we had a global epidemic going on, and then they basically tried to take the money back. And, of course, the situation with the University of California where they basically had an offer sheet, but that situation was like kind of open, and then their issues about that. Um, this is all about what you said about them being a shitty brand in terms of how business is done. Um, we're not trying to shade them because everything they've done is on public record. There's been ad nauseum articles about it and everything. Um, you know, I mean, of course they signed Joel and B, but traditionally big men don't really sell shoes like that. Um, I mean, when you look at the branding with Under Armour, Sean, if you were, and of course Kevin Plank stepped down as a CEO, still he's on as a consultant. But, you know, he saw that there were problems. I mean, we're not in the company. We don't know what talks were had with the Board of Governors and everything. Um, I'm running down the road a little bit. Let me uh, slow down. Sean, if you were um, in the Under Armour's position in terms of understanding that your brand is not necessarily uh, thinking, but it's not really going ahead of it to really, really get um, real traction in the game, what would you recommend that they do if you were in charge of that company? They're going to have to pay me for that. <laughs> They're going to have to pay me for that. Sold but, not to, game is to be sold, not to be told. We understand. That's, that, that, that's exactly right. But, but the basics of it is – Right, right. The truth is, this is just the basics of it. This is just, you know, um, brass tacks among all of us, right? Yes, sir. Nobody yes, wants sir. to wear Under Armour shoes. Why not? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's it. That's the basics of it. Nobody wants to wear Under right. Armour shoes, and why don't they? Now... What you said, Sean, also, too, because we want to build off of that more. Uh, we're loving this conversation. Um, when you talk about players that are like kids, the next generation are aspiring to be like, we're looking at the major players. We're looking at Ja Moran, um, who I think, yep. I mean, God, yep. Ja is just on another level. I mean, who that boy is special? He's special. Um, you know, uh I mean, you know, the Ball Brothers. I mean, Lonzo's doing his thing. You know, LaMelo. All those is, I mean, Adidas. Yeah, you know, LaMelo is doing his thing in Charlotte. You know, uh, Puma, it was rumored they gave him a $200 million deal plus use of the private company's private jet whenever. Uh, James Harden got $200 million from Adidas. Um, if, we, if we go to it for a minute uh, with Harden, Great player, all-time great scorer. Um, what's missing for James being able to connect with Adidas in terms of they really are not able to push him? It's not that they're not able to push him because they have his shoes everywhere. He's mm-hmm. in a lot of their major marketing campaigns. No one wants right. to be like James Harden. It's a simple ingredient. The people who sell shoes are the ones who the consumers can see themselves being like that person. They put those shoes on and they embody and personify that person, be it on the court Mm -hmm. or in their attitude. You know, Charles Mm -hmm. Barkley was somebody who sold shoes more based on his attitude that people related to more than his play. Michael Jordan was Mm -hmm. somebody who sold shoes more on his performance on the court rather than how he looked off the court. Right. I don't want to be like these people in some respect, you know. And that's why I said Under Armour is losing with Steph because Steph is the most relatable, likable person who in some respects has a crossover audience that Under Armour has refused to tap into. My wife and I watch mm. Holy Mode every week. We love that mm-hmm. show. We're big mini golf fans. 
Why right. aren't every single player who plays on Holy Moly wearing Steph Curry shoes and it's his show? Wow. That's, yeah. yeah. That's the only one I'm giving away. Because me and my wife Understood. say that every week. Understood. Every week we Understood. say that. Yeah. Every week we and, say and that. I mean, and Brandon is everything in terms of visibility and seeing it. You know, Nike figured that out early because with Jordan, he was such a unbelievable force. You know, this is coming in. He's coming in at 84, you know, and this is when guys like, of course, you know, uh, Dr. J, you know, Connie Hawkins and all those guys, you know, are kind of on their way out, you know. So it's like they're looking. You know, Magic has already been in the league a few years. Bird, of course, they were in Converse. You know, but Michael just comes in off of a gold medal and a college championship, you know, and basically just revolutionizes the game in a way of their, you know, athleticism we had never seen prior to. He had just taken it to another level. Um, But even then, Nike figured it out early that while some people couldn't see Mike, you know, couldn't see themselves being like Mike, you know, that's when they created the chunking because they broke it down into subsets of Air Jordan. Like you had Air Flight, Air Force, all of that, you know, which were really um, – and, I mean, of course, I mean, who can forget – I was watching the Big East documentary, and they were talking about John Thompson about when he started, you know, when he got his deal with Nike back in the day. <laughs> He's like – and John, rest in peace, Big John. John was just always real with John. Said, "I want my boys to graduate, but I also want to get paid too." And he was like, "Baby, he's like Nike broke them all." But you saw the culture really begin to with college, Syracuse, St. John's, all of that, man. I mean, you're from New York. You're Big East. You're in the heart of the Big East. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know. I, I, I mean, all the greats during that time, Pearl Washington, I mean, Chris Mullen, you know, Ed Mark Pickey. Jackson. Yeah, Mark Jackson, man. <laughs> how, do, how do we forget you know, Mark Jackson? One of the greatest point guards ever, point guard. We can't even call him point guard. We call him point guard, you know. And, of course, rest in peace to his brother Cadillac Jackson, man. Yep. You know, Troy. Yep. Yep. You know, I mean, um, those, those – yeah. You, you know, we we have to realize that it's a new day and time and mm-hmm. the same business models that worked to sell shoes before will never work again. Sneaker companies right. are all going to miss the mark until they realize that. And they're all missing the mark. Nike, Adidas, Puma, Reebok, everybody's missing the mark on realizing that. You know? And they have the real estate here to do it. We just mentioned, right, three stars in the league, right? Steph Curry still got rubber on the road with Under Armour. Ja Morant with Nike. LaMelo Ball with Puma. Those are three right there who are still very relevant and and on the pulse of what's happening right now, you know, with their fan base, with the NBA, and with, you know, the crossover effect. And right. all right. three of their brands are not doing anything properly with them. <laughs> now, um, I guess we're going to go there to a degree, Sean. Um, and we just say this because this is just from a marketing perspective, and we know black is in right now in terms of the urban market. Would you say where they're missing the mark, do you think, in terms of, would you say the urban market, or is there another demographic or another no, outlet? No, it's got to be bigger than the urban market. No, no, Understood. it's got to be bigger. To clarification. Okay, got it. It's got to be it's 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 got to be the crossover appeal that makes everybody want to relate to you, and the only way they can relate to you is through buying your shoes. That's the common ground that they all have, and Understood. you know, more so than Steph. Lamelo and Ja Morant, they got these kids on lock right now in terms of their their the captive audience. Mm-hmm. And Nike and Puma are not giving kids what they'd be happy to consume from them. Mm-hmm. Ja Morant don't have a signature shoe yet, but 
Rumor is it's being worked on. Let's see what happens with they that. Better. If you look at John Morant's social media, John Morant <laughs> mm-hmm. is on on trend with what these kids like to see today. LaMelo Ball. Yeah. On AT&T commercials. You know, he's, Slick you know, fast. him and his bad. You know, they like, they're on trend. They're, they're, they're relevant in other spaces besides selling shoes. And nobody's crossing that over. It's ridiculous. It's nauseating. It's annoying. It's so easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, we look at what uh, the situation was years ago. Um, and a lot of people were looking, were one question about the trajectory. Uh, when we look at LiAngelo, LaMelo, and Lonzo, all three of those boys can play. Um, their dad, you know, LeVar, you know, much respect, you know, because what he tried to do with Big Baller Brand, um, it was definitely noble. And I, I respect anybody, especially a black man, trying to set up generational wealth for his kids. But I think also, too, LeVar was missing the point because he thought by a bombastic personality, and he's not a bad guy. He can be obnoxious at times, but that's just who he is, and he's good-natured about it. But he really thought that he could kind of, Move that shift to where he thought what it was going to be with Big Ball of Brand. But like you said, Sean, it's about having that reach. And then having shoes, you know, cost that much off top. And then, you know, it doesn't help that your son was getting injured playing in them. And then off, then off too, it's like, and he was saying about how LeBron's shoes weren't worth as much as his brand was. I'm like, but yours being more doesn't make it better. And LeBron, is a certified legend in the game. He's earned that spot to where he has the cachet as a player, as a brand, that he can move in that capacity. You can't come in just starting out and think you're the biggest kid on the block when there's already someone bigger than you that's been running the block. Um, I would never pay $495 for a sneaker from a person who never scored a professional bucket. My point exactly. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And it's that simple. Yeah. And it's like, and there's so many nuances. Like you said, nobody scored a professional bucket. You know, this hasn't even been seen with celebrities to give it that push. You know, it's like, yes, your boys are great. You know, but it's like we knew they could play in. You know, we we saw Lonzo for that one year he did at UCLA, which was phenomenal. The boy. You know, I'm so happy for him because I know what he went through coming in to the league. But to see where he is now with my Chicago Bulls and how he's really, really finding his way, um, you know, has a point guard mentality. Pass first, shot second, create plays for his teammates, great player, great personality on the team. He, All the boys understand that. Uh, but like you said, it has to be built from the ground up. And you can't just come in and, like, say you're the greatest and you haven't shown everybody why you're the greatest yet. Um, Big fact. Hey, I was going to say this, man, because, you know, he said that he has to wrap it up at 945, man. We want to thank you for joining us and giving us some good yeah. sneaker content, as a matter of fact. That's, that's, that's good for the archives, you know what I'm saying? Because we want to have a good, welcome. diverse range. Definitely. You're very much welcome, um, brothers. Johnny, you know we got to bring you back too, man, because we got to talk about how you came up, you know, how you and your people came up with the program you all have right now. Uh, but this is what you all have done with your initiative, your design. It is, it's unbelievable. We, 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 we would be doing you an injustice by not having you back on the show for you to talk about this is something – it's about having representation. Representation matters, especially from our community, yep. and about how you all really, really took the, 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 the initiative to really push for that. Um, you know we'll be in touch on IG we're on the phone, Sean. Once again, yep. it took a while, but we got it going, Sean. We, we appreciate this so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, thank you for having me. We're definitely going to do part two, man, but um, I want to make sure everybody out there – goes and checks out our college website and see the programs we have to offer. Plug it, plug Um, it, plug it, plug it. The website is Pensoul, 
P E N S O L E Lewis L E W I S dot com. The full story on how the college was established, formerly Lewis College of Business and HBCU, which was the only one in America that far north of the South in Detroit, and now how we've come back as Penn Sol Lewis College of Business and Design. Um, Dwayne's personal story, our founder, Dwayne Edwards, who was the designer and creator of the Air Jordan 21 and 22, and the Nike Goa Dome 2. Um, and um, just make sure you check us for all our initiatives. And me personally, I can be found on IG at OSD underscore Paper Chaser, P-A-P-E-R-C-H-A-S-R. And, um, um, you know, T Max to tell you, you know, you come polite and with respect. I'm happy to talk to you and engage and, you know, give anybody some, some nuggets of wisdom and encouragement to push on. Um, but, you know, don't come with silliness. <laughs> Absolutely not. No silliness. Yeah. We're still, look, we're about smiles with the sneakers, but Sean will turn savage if you get stupid with them. <laughs> so. I, I, I am from Brooklyn. Let's not forget. <laughs> DK all day. <laughs> That's but, but, way. You know, but you know, one of the things that um I think is important is, you know, even with you know, coming on and, and talking with you brothers is is more of these conversations being had. Um mm-hmm. and you guys keeping it going in all the respective about all the respective industries and, and in the different mediums where you can express it. Um we got to start having and owning these narrat- having these discussions and owning these narratives um, because it's being gentrified. White people are coming in and, and wiping out all black contribution to everything that makes billions of dollars. And yeah, unless we yeah. own our masters, which means we own our stories and start telling them ourselves, um, it's going to continue to happen. You know, case in Absolutely. point, Rolling Stone magazine just put out their top ten hip hop albums of all time. Based on what? And they put Biggie as number one. And they put Biggie as number one. I mean, and I'm like, I'm just. My question is, who gave them the authority to put that list out where it matters? Anyone can make a list. Sure. Right. Have at it. Right. But we in our communities have stopped. Have got to stop giving these publications and people who we know are not from our experience um, the credibility of these things that they create where they try to give themselves false authority over our creativity. Sure, we've mm. had people in the black community who say, black and Latin community that say Biggie's album was the best of all time, but then there's 100,000 other people who disagree with that, all in the same neighborhood. So, exactly. you know, there's, there's, there's a diverse um, train of thought, and there's a diverse amount of opinion among us who are authorities and who live these experiences and we're not taking control of that. We're giving Rolling Stones and MTV and BuzzFeed and Complex all this authority by buying into this shit that they put out. This shit just needs to come out and people just read it and push on. You know, people out here having arguments over it. and Like, it's nuts. All you're doing is giving them more authority and credibility in the shit that they had no authority or credibility over. So... And, you know, and we're going to do that in do. part two. Yeah, we're going to we're going to have that? a conversation in part two about we're going to and Sean, that's that's a great template for part two when you come back on about the award shows about who is validating what we created Absolutely. in terms of saying what we do if it's palatable or not. And like you said, we have well, to take that back and say what no, this is what we're going to represent for ourselves, not what you tell us it's going to be. And that's why we've done what we've done with sneakers. That's the very mission and reason why we've done what we've done with sneakers. You can't tell us who have lived right. this, who have owned thousands of pairs of sneakers, who, even me right now, I have 29 different brands of sneakers in my closet. So you can't talk to me within the mind frame of just Yeezys and Jordans. I, my, what I'm, my sneaker experience is just far past that little narrow existence. So... Right. Nobody that is into that can talk to me. You know, like you can't talk to me on my level if all you've ever owned were Jordans and Yeezys. You can listen to right. me. Right. You should listen to me because I have more of a perspective to give you that I think will help you. But mm-hmm. you can't talk to me about you know 
what's hot right now and think that the entire eighty billion dollar industry moves based on those two types of shoes. You you're just moving wrong. You you, you coming just at like it wrong. Hip-hop. So just like hip hop. Yep. You know, we we try to tell the youngins, it's like they say, Well, you know, Lil Baby's the best rapper ever. I'm like, How? Rock him, Nas, Jay, they're still alive. You know, you know. Well, see, that's a, that's, that's like, even a different argument. That's even a different argument. You know, that that I'll leave with this one, and we can continue. You know, mm-hmm. there's not four elements to hip hop. There's five elements to hip hop, and the fifth element is knowledge and mentorship, and being able to share that yeah. is, exactly. is critical. And that's not happening anymore. And these kids have found a way to get money, and do it their way. You can't criticize that if you didn't reach out to help them with their foundation. Mm. That's, that's the same as, as somebody in the NBA talking to a gold digger saying, you wasn't with me when I was shooting in the gym. It's the same thing. Exactly. So you got to let these youngins go and do what they're going to do, and they're going to have their perspective on it because they did it their way. Nobody from the old school came back to help them. Nobody from, right. you know, the early 2000s, late 90s, who was popping, reached out and said, hey, young blood, let me help you out. Based on my experience, you could be doing this like this. You know, there's none of that. So we do that in the sneaker industry. We do that. Penso has over 700 people who have come through the program working in the industry. Social studies has almost 100 who have come through that program working in the industry and counting and all of those people we are still in contact with in some way, shape, or form. Send them our way on IG because we want to follow as many as possible. Um, and you all are an essential service for the culture, for the community, for the world. Uh, we know you got to go, Sean. God bless. Thank you so much. We're going to be in touch brother. with you, man. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Keep doing what y'all doing. Always. I'll be back soon. Okay, man, appreciate you, man. Thank you again. To be continued, brother. Thank you. Yes. Always, Equal brother. will be super. King, take us out of here. Yeah, we on out of here, man. Catch us tomorrow <clears throat> night, same time, same channel. We got DJ King Assassins in the building. And we yep. out. Peace.